little advertising and marketing. You got a deal. Coffee All with right. Ken, or you call it Take Five. Take Five. So I want to welcome everybody into today's show. Uh, this is uh, our first of what I hope is going to be many. And if you had an opportunity to watch our St. Louis Media History Hall of Fame this year, you saw my guest for today, Advertising Hall of Famer Walt Jashik. Walt and I did a bit in the beginning. Hey, Walt. <laughs> Walt and I did a be bit in the beginning of the, of the program where we did a Zoom call together. And that sparked an idea of let's get together and talk to our Hall of Famers. And I thought who would be best to start this off and kick this off for us than our friend Walt Jashik. Uh, Walt has been a longtime copywriter and part of Paul and Walt Worldwide. He now is a freelance copywriter. He also has an interest in comic books and other things that I'll let Walt talk about. Uh, but I just wanted to introduce Walt and just say, Walt, welcome to today's episode of Take Five, where we're going to ask you five questions and just get you to talk about what your background is and just share a little bit about what you're doing these days as well. Honored to do so, Ken. Happy to be your guinea pig on your pilot episode. <laughs> well, thank you. I, hey, I just want to start off. Now, all superheroes have an origin story, and they all True. start somewhere. How did Walt Jashik start in advertising and copywriting? Well, I was 24 years old and had never been inside an ad agency, never took a class in advertising, and didn't really have any advertising in my portfolio. So I thought, copywriting, that's for me. Now, what really happened was I went out to Colorado from St. Louis to seek my fame and fortune and realized as many 24 year olds do that fortune begins with a job, <laughs> right? What right. did you th say many 20 somethings come to that conclusion? And um, I went to the newspaper classified ads. Remember those? Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. under W, there was a writer. And there was an ad agency in Colorado Springs looking for a copywriter. I went in with a portfolio that looked something like this. It okay. had lots of stuff in it. It had newspaper feature stories. It had comics. It had columns. And it only had one ad, one ad. And it was an ad that I did for my college newspaper when I was editor promoting next year's editor applications for. Hmm. It was a quarter page ad. I showed that to the creative director. She went, hmm. She took that ad into the president of the company came back out and said, you're hired, you start Monday. Like, wow. I was what, what, uh, what university did you go to? Where'd you graduate? I'm still University of Missouri, St. Louis. Ah, oh, so you're In a St. Louis seven. boy, I mean, all around. Yeah, most of my 40 something year career has been here, but for those first early years, I was out in the mountains, having a blast, writing copy. And I fell in love with advertising. As a creative person, I realized you can be a copywriter anywhere. If you want to write music, right, you have to go to Nashville. If you wanted to do episodic television at the time, you had to go to LA. But you could live a creative life in Colorado Springs, in Denver, in Memphis, and in St. Louis. It's like, wow, this is super fun. And it was. And it's like a toy store. Because if you go into some of the other creative arts, photography, you're always taking pictures music production, you're always producing music. But as a young copywriter, it's like, on Monday, you're in a helicopter shooting footage. On Tuesday, you're recording a jingle. On Thursday, you're arguing fonts. <laughs> and then Friday, they said, well, you're writing copy for the swimsuit catalog. <clears throat> Can you be at the swimsuit shoot? Yeah, I could probably make some time. You could probably do that. Well, that's one of the things I love when you and I first started talking about the bit that we did for the Hall of Fame is the idea of theater of the mind and Stan Freeberg, how Freeberg wrote radio commercials that were just so descriptive and just allowed you to do so many things that you wouldn't be able to do with a budget uh, if you were filming these. 
you know, when you think about copywriting and, and theater of the mind, what are some of the things that get you going and get you motivated? The fact that radio, which became our bread and butter and our wheelhouse a few years later for many years, is a writer's medium. Hmm. You do a TV spot, you're going to have a big committee. Everybody, right? You do a lot of TV and video. Everybody is in on that. <laughs> the art directors, the AEs, everybody say it's a collaboration. But I learned early on that radio that uh, is a playground they let you play in mm -hmm. and they leave you alone. So pretty much whatever you're coming up with pretty much ends up on the air. So that's cool. It's unfiltered for one thing. Uh, and as you say, unlimited budget in theater of the mind. You know, they're the famous spots where helicopters are dumping jello into the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can afford to do that on radio. <laughs> and we have, I have some spots. We did a whole lot of radio for years. Well, oh, good. Yeah, we'll go into some of those spots. But before I do that, let me ask a couple quick things. I need to follow up. So you went to UMSL. Right. And what years what was this? What year time frame? The late 70s. I graduated in 78. Okay. I was a five-year undergrad because, as with many UMSL students, I was working full-time, 40 hours a week and going to school. Plus, I loved college. I loved UMSL. I loved the classes. I thought I got a grade A plus education from the professors and the curriculum. And I was having a blast. I was on the UMSL Current, editor of the Current, in the university players, whatever they UMSL threw at me. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, I, uh, I participated. Oh. It was a wonderful time to be at the school. Well, and I've got to ask you the typical St. Louis question then. Where'd you go to high school? Jennings High School, North County. Okay. Yeah, it was real leave it to beaver land then. And it's, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a wonderful school now, I hear, that's really yeah. coming back. Well, and if you got into advertising in St. Louis in the late 70s, well, you started in Colorado, yeah. uh, correct, in the agency. Yeah, but about even three or four years out there, came back to raise a family and work here. Okay. Now, that time frame of advertising was still some of the just the glory years. Uh, budgets were big, uh, clients were doing a lot. What were your impressions of being a young guy uh, in an advertising agency in the late 70s, early 80s? All of the above. Yeah, we had budgets. <laughs> we had a lot of creative freedom. We had a lot of um, motivation to create great stuff. There was an expectation that your next TV spot, your next radio commercial, your next print ad would have a big idea, that it would be breakthrough, that it would compete with everybody else. There was no phoning it in, let's put mm -hmm. it that way. And we loved the work hmm. we were seeing out of St. Louis from the big agencies, from Darcy, from Gardner. We loved the stuff that was on the air from the aforementioned radio giants like Freeberg, and uh, uh, it was just very heady and inspiring, hmm. but also challenging. It's like you couldn't phone it in. Right. It's like, okay, what's today's big idea, right? <laughs> well, who were some of your influences back then? Well, the radio guys that were terrific. Uh, Dick Orkin was hmm. doing top-notch radio for years. There's like it would just stop you in your tracks. Uh, and it was really, really funny stuff. And that's when I realized funny radio really enhances a brand. It makes you fall in love with the brand. So we loved Orkin, we loved Freebird, we loved anybody that was doing that theater of the mind. And my buddy, Paul Fay, the Paul and Paul and Walt Worldwide, we were real advertising nerds in college and later. Like we would stop and say, did you see that car spot? It had yeah. Vangelis music in it. Like, yeah, Vangelis, that was cool. And our friends would look at us like, you, you're talking about a, a TV commercial? To them, it was like, like talking about the wallpaper. They didn't notice it, but we were into it. 
Why, why, why do I have this vision of you and Paul just running down the beach? <laughs> just some Vangelis in the background. <laughs> Slow-mo. Slow-mo, yep. That's hey, us. Now, he moved out there. Uh, he, I remember him on the beach thinking, I could move out here. <laughs> and he had the clients in entertainment mm -hmm. promotion. He had the CBSs of the NBCs in the King world as we started to team up. But had he not moved out there, uh, I probably wouldn't have been writing all those spots for CBS, but he did. Thanks, Paul. He's out there now, happy in California. How did you guys connect? How did you, how did you first get with Paul and Walt worldwide? We were buddies as undergrads at UMSL, okay. both on the school paper. He was the editor after me. I guess he responded to that ad I put in the UMSL current. And uh, we had a lot of similar tastes in comedy, talked about funny radio even then, talked about the spots. Yeah. And had a few entrepreneurial adventures before we became Paul and Walt. We syndicated comics to uh, college newspapers, stuff like that. Oh, that's great. All right. Question number two. Yes, sir. So I told you I'm going to do five questions, but I may do a few questions in between. But question oh, cool. number two, we were talking about some of your favorite ads and some of the favorite campaigns. Can you share with me some of your favorite ads or some of the favorite campaigns that you've done, uh, either from you or maybe from some others? Sure. Well, I've got I've got my stuff handy. Okay. Uh, let's some Paul and Walt spots. To do that, I will share my screen and play a couple of funny radio commercials in the heyday of entertainment promotion when we were tasked with promoting shows like Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune and the CBS primetime lineup and everything that was on the air in the 90s basically <laughs> came with a promo campaign. Now here, for example, is a spot for the TV show Matlock. Matlock. You remember Matlock in syndication? Yep. Right, and, on, and we did dozens of spots a week. In this one, the creative brief said, help the audience Remember that Matlock has moved to four o'clock in the afternoon. And so see if you can remember from this spot what time Matlock is on. Missing persons. Missing persons. Missing persons. My wife is missing. Your wife is missing. My wife is missing. When did you last see her? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Where's your TV, sir? The bedroom. Have you looked in the bedroom, sir? Uh, no. She's probably watching Matlock. Matlock is on at four o'clock? Every weekday at four on channel two. Go check your bedroom, sir. I'll wait. Okay. Hello? I'm here. She's watching Matlock. I thought so. I didn't know Matlock was on at four o'clock. Every weekday at four on channel two. She really likes Andy Griffith. Of course she does. She must be so engrossed by Matlock, she forgot to tell me where she was. Tell her I understand. Okay, I'll be right back. No, I didn't mean uh, Sir? Matlock, every weekday at four on Channel 2. Hey, my favorite episode. Because there's nothing like a good mystery. I'm hanging up now, sir. Hello? It helps to have those great Hollywood actors yeah. reading my copy. I'm very blessed. And Paul directing. Well, I love that it, it kind of had a dragnet feel. Sure. That was the idea. It was yep. a Jack Webb staccato dialogue spot. Just the facts. Just the facts. Just the facts. And how many and times did you say four o'clock? There's got to be a half dozen in there at least. Yeah. And I, you, for college classes, I used to say, uh, not tell them what time it was on. See if they could remember. And imagine a spot actually working. We also were honored to work to promote the syndicated launch of The Simpsons and got the late great Robert Goulet to orate the writings of Bart. Here's the kind of work we did on any given Wednesday. And now, Mr. Robert Goulet reads from The Writings of Bart, the collected after-school blackboard writings of young Bart Simpson. Mr. Goulet. I will not trade pants with others. I will not do that thing with my tongue. I will not Xerox my butt. A burp is not an answer. I will not pledge allegiance to Bart. I will not eat things for money. I will not bring sheep to class. 
I will not instigate revolution. My name is not Dr. Death. To experience all of Bart's Blackboard writings, watch every classic episode of The Simpsons. I will not call the principal Spudhead. The Simpsons, now five times a week. There you are. Now, there how'd you get Robert Goulet to say, I will not Xerox my butt? <laughs> he was a great sport. We pitched him the script. He said, sure, I'll do this. He was a friend of the show of The Simpsons. He's on an episode. He sings Jingle Bell's Batman spells, uh, Batman smells. And uh, again, it was, you were saying, it was the era of, you had the budget? Like, who can we get? Who do we want for this? Samuel Jackson, how about Goulet? <laughs> and that was part of a, a campaign that was also on air, outdoor. And they, the Simpsons, as you can imagine, had a very successful syndicated launch. Mm -hmm. And then while I'm sharing the screen before I put it back, so. CBS was a client for years. We did on-air promotions as well as radio. So the stuff promoting like the CBS Monday Night lineup, et cetera, and all the shows you could imagine in the 90s. And I just found this on cassette. They asked us in 1992 to help them create their annual holiday on-air promotion. You know how networks mm -hmm. have a happy holiday message. In my basement in South St. Louis, I wrote a poem called Holiday Wishes. The idea was that all the hit shows of the era would have one line of the poem and uh, all building up into a holiday message. Sure enough, a few weeks, uh, the network bought it. Right. And sure enough, a few weeks later, I see this spot on the air. So get, take a breath. It has dozens of 90s TV stars in it reciting their holiday wishes. We wish you the gift that love can bring. The gift that keeps on giving. I wish for just one win this year. I wish to just keep living. I wish you love and lasting joy. We wish you a scrumptious diet. I wish you hope and peace on earth. Or at least some peace and quiet. We wish you warm and cozy nights. And the greatest wish of all is a wish you make with your family. No matter how big, or how small. Happy holidays. How wow, that? that's a trip down CBS memory lane. <laughs> Isn't it? Candace Bergen is pregnant in that spot. And the reference to how small is very deliberate. Do you remember the controversy with Murphy Brown or were you too young? A presidential, vice presidential candidate, Dan Quayle, criticized the show for glorifying single motherhood I do recall that. Yeah. So the show pushed back a little bit. And I think one of the reasons CBS bought this spot is it has a little gentle nod too. It's a wish you make with your family, no matter how big or how small. And that was Tuesday. The next day we <laughs> <laughs> like, it'd be late night. And I was in my basement in South St. Louis, as I mentioned, faxing this stuff to Paul for years. And uh, those magicians out there turned it into the kind of work uh, that I'm still now, finding in, in the basement. Were you working with an agency or were you hired by an agency or were you and Paul, the people that came in and pitched these ideas? We were the agency. Okay. So you oh, were, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For many years, big, beautiful offices on Sunset Boulevard but I was raising a family here and liked it here. And I stayed and um, did go out to see that spot being recorded some of the shows. But uh, yeah, we, we were a boutique radio agency and uh, still are when people want funny radio. Hmm. So I'm gonna put these links uh, down below in the YouTube uh, description. So. If anybody wants to watch more of these, uh, you have your own website, right? Or your own, well, you have your own website and you have your own YouTube channel, correct? Yeah, while you're on YouTube, you can go to Walt Now and see all kinds of these goodies and some new stuff as well. So thanks for the plug. Oh, no problem. Happy to, I love that CBS ad, especially Thank now. You. So yeah, I'm, it's destined for Facebook in the days ahead. All right, good, good. 
So, uh, well, what would you consider to be your work ethic? Uh, you know, how do you go about the craft or the art of writing? Right. Well, you, I make it habitual. It has to be um, a habit every day. I consider myself a journeyman writer. I'm not an author. It's what do you, what do you mean by that? Unpack it's, that a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's a journeyman. It's a job. You know, it's like not high art. It is, uh, it is a vocation. You get up, you write five spots, <laughs> you go, go home, you get up the next day, you write five spots. You don't chant for inspiration. Uh, and I found that to be a successful format for years. It's mostly, it's also compartmentalizing. I am spend my mornings doing extroverted stuff, okay. uh, interviews, reading creative briefs, meeting with the account team, pitching, pitching, pitching. But as a writer or anybody in the creative world, you have to then shut the door, say from one to seven, I, I'm writing. I'm not going to pitch any ideas for the next six hours. I'm not even going to respond to emails, et cetera, et cetera. So the ethic involves repetition. And also I think it involves leaning in. You can't get too stuck. You can't, in advertising marketing, as you know, you can't, you can't have writer's block. <laughs> you just have to start typing. And uh, that's pretty much what I do. Sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's just typing. Well, thinking about that, you know, with the, can't having writer's block. What was the fastest ad that you ever wrote that was then produced? That is a good question. That is a good question. When we were really cranking, I would fax five spots a day. CBS would pick out one, produce it sometimes that next day, but I can't think of a specific example. I'll have to dig through that yeah. and see what the, what the fastest would be. I bet there is a great anecdote that I'll remember when we're done. <laughs> we can have an addendum. I just yeah. I laugh that you keep saying I had to fax it. So yeah. for, for those no who don't remember what a fax machine is. <laughs> we did evolve mm -hmm. to, to email. We had an AOL account. Took forever to upload a script. We're much faster at it now. Yep. Yeah. What other what other craft or what other skills do you feel that are necessary to be a good copywriter? Well, distilling a creative brief into the main benefits, getting it down to just a few benefits. As you know, from your experience in advertising and marketing, the creative briefs are very ambitious. They want to say a whole lot of things in our marketing campaigns. That's okay. We have a lot of important things to say, but I'd say the ability to distill it to one benefit at a time mm -hmm. and to demonstrate one benefit at a time is a great skill for a copyright. Just talk about one thing. If you have plenty of free parking, the lowest prices in town, and the greatest selection of polyester suits, just do the polyester suits. If you want to do a free parking spot, do another spot. I say that a lot, and that served us well. Uh, the ability to balance head and heart is hmm. a copywriter skill. You have to process all the left brain stuff of course, and be able to discuss it. The analytics, we're in an era of analytics and data, mm -hmm. but you also have to ignore it and talk to the heart, which is where I think people make their buying decisions. And so the ability to distill and to speak to the heart, hmm. I find to be very helpful. Yeah. I would always joke that most creative briefs are neither creative nor brief. <laughs> and that's always the hardest part is getting to that one or two at the most. Two at points. the most. Yeah, right. two at the most. And I, I think too often we try to do too much in an ad and you end up not being able to catch anything. I, I use the example. I saw a great, there was a great movie called The Art of, The Fine Art of Advertising. And it was a German producer and he was talking to Tony Lowe, I believe it was. 
and they were talking about tennis balls. And I can take, if you have one tennis ball and you throw it at somebody, you can catch it. But when you take a whole handful of tennis balls and throw it, then you don't grab anything. And that has always stuck with me when it came to messaging. Perfect analogy. Yeah, that, it wasn't mine. So that's why it's perfect. <laughs> so. You've got a lot of wisdom in, in you and in those books behind you. Those are ad books, right? Yeah, those, yeah, that's my advertising collection of different uh, history books and things like that. I love advertising history. So um, there is a story that I wanted to pull out. And speaking of advertising history, it goes into the history of Paul and Walt worldwide. And I don't have it handy. I could go grab it. I might, we'll show it on the screen. But in the directory of the Ad Club St. Louis, a number of years ago, there was an, there was an ad that was in there that was from Paul and Walt Worldwide, and it showed a pair of cutout red underwear. Now, I remember that. I was in the Ad Club back in those days. I'm still on the Ad Club board now. And share with me the story of the Paul and Walt Worldwide red underwear. Why can you mean the story of this? <laughs> I didn't realize you actually had a pair. Oh yeah, we've got props. The story, in addition to being goofy, actually has some St. Louis media history in it. In 1988, I was a freelancer working out of my basement and I submitted a few things to the St. Louis Addy Awards, mm -hmm. the storied local ad award program. I submitted two or three things. I went back to work. I got a call from the ad club saying, are you going to be at the Addies this year? It's like, yeah, okay. Okay, we're just checking. Uh, no big deal. Now, what I wanna set the stage with is the image of Powell Symphony Hall. Ken, as you know, back in those days, this is the 80s, this is 89. Okay. The Addies were a deal. It was at Powell Symphony Hall, packed, semi-black tie, not wow. an empty seat in the house. In addition to all the agency people, SIU had their ad school there. Webster had their ad school. It was a deal. Lights, a comedian host, John Biner, the late John Biner. He was known wow. for impersonations. Yeah. So as a black tie host, uh, a orchestra, uh, it was kind of, you know, Oscar's light or Oscar's medium. And I leave my basement and show up and people are blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's like, there he is. It's like, what's, what's going on? Won a few awards consistently and a best of show. Surprisingly, nobody tipped me off. A very great honor. Went up, didn't have a speech, didn't think you needed a speech. You needed a speech <laughs> in those days. I wish somebody said, you're gonna need a speech. So I thanked my family, thank, thanked clients and said, I am glad I wore my lucky red underwear. I got a medium John Biner size laugh. Now, you it, didn't have them in your hand. You just said No, that. no, I just okay. said. Because okay. that was actually a running joke with Paul and me back from our college days. Got a laugh. Biner went with it, referred to it a few more times that night. There was some lovely publicity the next morning and got quoted on that. There were ad columns, et cetera, et cetera. I just went back to work. And, you know, over the years, we had a nice run and of awards, Paul and I were very blessed here and elsewhere to win some other Addies. And we just kept building on it, including our self promo as the ad you referred to. Then one year when the Addies were at the Science Center in the 90s, we went to Sticks, Bear and Fuller, now Dillard's, and bought a bunch of red underwear in packaging and shared the luck with the crowd. We threw the red underwear into the crowd. People are grabbing it, you know, as if Fred Bird were shooting out right. uh, uh, t-shirts. People grabbed them and years later, people in the ad community would come up to me in stores and say, hey, well, I've got your underwear. I still have your underwear. 
like depending on who I was with, <laughs> that could be semi-embarrassing. <laughs> yep, I can see that. I can yep. see that. Well, but I still I'm keep sure. them around. You never know. You never know when you need that lucky pair. Right. Uh, let's wrap up because I'm keeping you pretty long here, but I want you to just share some advice uh, that you'd give to any up and coming writers. You know, it doesn't have to be advertising specific, but if you were a, a graduate right now of college and you're looking to find your first job or you're looking to transition into a writing role, what, what pieces of advice could Walt Jashik share? Well, I, I have three and I have had copywriters in the room giving them advice like this. I did teach at Webster for a few years. I'd say, don't do what I did. Don't go into an interview without any ads. Pack one, pack your book with ads. Do some spec work. Get all your classroom work. Put it in there. Write, 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 and write. And do all kinds of writing. That's one B. Do all kinds of writing. It, you may or may not be surprised that I have young copywriters who don't really write anything. They don't have letters to the editor or articles or song lyrics. It's writers write and then can make the transition into copywriting. So that's one, actually have ads as opposed to me when I did that first interview. Uh, two, put your heart into it. And what I mean is don't let any pitch go by. Every job is important. If you have a three postcard direct mail campaign, make it the best darn three postcard direct mail campaign that you possibly can. Have delusions of grandeur. It's like when this bank president sees my three postcard direct mail campaign, he's going to call me into his office and say, who wrote these postcards? <laughs> now that never happens, <laughs> but you do get paid. That's your, that's your grandeur. And so that's one aspect of putting your heart into it. Actually, I'm gonna try for the wow here. And secondly, Put the emotion in it. Again, I believe people make buying decisions in their heart, not their head. We could debate that in another video. But heart is on a spectrum from funny to heartfelt. And I believe the best advertising and marketing has a lot of heart to it in one way, not necessarily in a sappy, string-laden spot, but in something that has emotional resonance. Push it a little bit to the emotional side. I'm getting emotional just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that goes back to lean in, don't have writer's block, just start typing. If you need five headlines, write 50. If you need 75 headlines, write 175. It's not precious. It's not high art, it's a craft that sells products and moves minds. That's excellent. I've always felt that the, the value of an advertising agency or copywriters like yourself is the curation of that. You know, when you take it to a client, you know, we would show, I was an account person myself, so we would show the creative, but we'd only show a handful. And even then, if there was any doubt, we'd kind of flip them over and, you know, not just what I'd call uh, advertising, Mr. Potato Head advertising, where you take a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this. Uh, but it's the curation of it. It's knowing what the, just those subtle little differences might be that will impact the ad even more effectively. That's well said. Yeah. Yeah, and it's having the ability to champion a good idea, even if it's not yours. And an AE can come up with that idea. And a good copywriter will say, that's that's it. I'm going to champion that idea. Everybody in the ad business is an A student and everybody's creative. It's just, <laughs> some people get to be called the creatives. Yeah. And I have a great deal of respect for all the minds in media and account as well. Yeah. Hey, let's just wrap up on just a couple of things. And these are, we've done our five questions. Now I just oh. want to just riff off of a couple of different things. Sure. One, uh, I had to laugh. I wrote a little note here when you were talking about you had to go up and give the speech. 
Yeah. Oh my God. But you weren't prepared for it. I'm so are you telling me that copywriters don't have these words just right in their head all the time? <laughs> that is what I'm telling you. Yeah. A writer's brain. It's writers walk around saying, I wish I'd said, because you develop the craft of writing it. Everybody's quick in advertising, but a writer's brain is right. Five things. And then say the one. I took an improv class last summer. Oh, wow. And uh, that demonstrated that I have a writer's brain. Other people, the improv minds, are like they're in the reality. I wanted to go sit, go off stage and say, well, let me let me think up, <laughs> let me think up a few funny lines. <laughs> so yeah, that is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, good. And then you mentioned coming back from Colorado to raise your family here. Mm -hmm. If you're comfortable with it, share a little bit about your family. How, how, do you have kids? Do you, yeah, what are they adult, doing? Or? Adult son, um, Adam Jashik works at the Missouri Botanical Gardens. Wow. He's the event manager there. He's the guy who gets thousands of people in through Garden Glow, now on at Missouri Botanical Gardens, and Whitaker Music Festival, uh, in the summer when there were music festivals, there will be again. There will be again. And from your uh, lips, Walt, from your lips. <laughs> there, cheers. <laughs> and uh, delightful extended family all over St. Louis. Very oh, cool. that's great. Last thing is talk to me about some of your comic book work or, you know, your interest in comic books and how that has progressed. Right. I'm a comic book collection here, lifelong collector, fanzine publisher, occasional writer of comics and uh, aspire to it again in a kind of uh, upcoming semi-retirement, I hope. The way that comic books and St. Louis overlap is a, a comic book I did for the St. Louis Blues and local McDonald's uh, as a promo in the, also in the 90s. Mm -hmm. We did a comic book series starring legendary Brett Hull. Maybe we could drop in a few uh, pics of it. I'll send yeah, you. Yeah, we'll, we'll put some pics in there. Yeah, and uh, that was a thrill. It merged my love of comics and storytelling because it was an epic science fiction story starring Brett Hull going into the future to win the Stanley Cup for the blues. Little did I know how prophetic it was. And uh, kids got the comic with a value meal. It was a promo for all from a now long gone promo agency called the Patrick Company. Remember yep. the Patrick Company? I think I actually involved, I actually worked with some of those guys it, at one point. Yeah, I think it involved some in, great local comic artists through it. Don Secrease, Rick Burchette, good buddies with whom I'm collaborating still. And if you were 10 and you got those comics, you probably still have them. And every once in a while, I'll see the blues uh, post on Twitter or Facebook. It's like, look what we have on the shelf here. It's like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> if you need extra copies, I can hook you up. I don't even think you have to be 10. I just think you have to have a love of comics. Uh, yeah, cool, man. And the other nerdy overlap with advertising is comics, like advertising, synthesize the visual and the verbal. They don't really exist without each other. You can have a great headline and a great visual, but the brain merges them for a great print ad, for example. You can't just have a headline. You can't just have a visual, though a lot of upscale brands try. And similarly in comics, you're reading the words and seeing the visual and you go, cool. What's going to happen to Bruce Wayne next? <laughs> 
I do love, if you think about the history of advertising, there are a number of eras where comics were actually used within ad campaigns. Yeah. So in the 30s and then again in the early 50s, you'd see some ads that would have whole comic strips uh, that would be part of them. Oh, that's true. That's great stuff. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. Was, yeah. No, go ahead. What were you going to say? It's, uh, what do they call it now? Sp uh, graphic novels? Yeah, graphic novels, but brand advertising of that Brett Hull comic was sort of a sponsored story, brand okay. brand stories, I guess they call them. And love to do more. Love to do more. Anybody well, that wants a comic book series for their brand, I can get the band back together. <laughs> well, then let's let's talk about that. How can somebody reach out to you, Walt? Do you have a website and your Twitter account or what, what's yeah, your social sure. media I am like? Walt Now everywhere. So I am Walt Now on Twitter. I am Walt now on Instagram. I am at waltnow.com. <laughs> Where aren't I, Walt now? It's like, what now? Walt now. So check me out. Uh, there are landing pages. I am open to have coffee at any time with anybody. I'm still writing away or just throwing out ideas. And uh, uh, ready to create more work now. All right. Well, Walt Jashik, thank you for being a part of this conversation today. Uh, again, we're hoping that we're able to do more of these with some of our other Hall of Famers, but we just wanted to get together and just have a few minutes of some coffee, some questions, and just kind of chat about what's going on. So Walt, I appreciate all your time. It was my great pleasure, truly, Ken. Thank you. Thank you.